Today is the 50th day of the national lockdown. In some cases, 50 is a good number. If you are a batsman in cricket, if it is a 50th birthday or a 50th wedding anniversary. Doubtless though, very few people feel good about this particular 50. We need to pray for great wisdom for the leaders of this country, particularly our president, his cabinet, members of the National Command Council and their advisers. Pray also for peace and restraint amongst our population, the police and the army. As people become daily more despairing, more desperate, more disgruntled and more disobedient, the potential for disaster is great and much prayer is needed. Yesterday, Terry Martin started a look at how James addresses the issue of favoritism or partiality amongst Christians and in our Lord's Church. We will carry on with that same topic today under the heading The Folly of Favoritism. The text we will be looking at is James chapter 2 verses 8 through 13. Open your Bibles with me and let's read them. From verse 8 and reading from the ESV. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Bear in mind that although this letter was written about AD 44, and to a particular audience at that time. It is also relevant to believers through the ages and to us today. So I will frequently refer to us as the audience along with the term readers and similar descriptions. From verses 1 to 7, we we recall that the brothers to whom James is writing were failing in the area of Christian love by treating people differently depending on their status and their position in society. The irony of it is that many of the believers were suffering persecution precisely because the rich and powerful in society were playing favorites, and they themselves were now doing the same thing. There are three issues James deals with in these verses. The first is that Favoritism violates God's law. In verse 8, James reminds us of God's command, You shall love your neighbor as yourself, a command given to the nation of Israel way back in Leviticus 19, verse 18, and echoed by Jesus in Matthew chapter 22, and verse 39. James called this the royal law, and there are at least two interpretations as to why this is so. The first is that it is called the royal law because it is the king of all God's laws. Jesus taught that all the commandments can be summarized in terms of loving God and loving our fellow men. In Matthew 22, from verse 36 to 39, we read Jesus' response to a Pharisee's question. Teacher, Which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus replied to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
The second view is that James was considering the nature of the lawgiver, God, the sovereign ruler and king of all, when calling it the royal law. Both interpretations are possible and in keeping with scripture. It doesn't really matter which we choose, as long as we embrace the answer. The law of love is indeed the royal law. James's audience probably thought that they were indeed following this law and were probably surprised by James's accusation. They may very well have responded that it was in response to the law of love that they were ministering to the rich and that they were not ministering to the poor not because of lack of love but because of lack of time. The poor man, as one commentator remarked, was just an unfortunate omission due to lack of time or real opportunity. In verse 8 we notice that James uses the word really, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, meaning that partial obedience is unacceptable. They had to show love to both rich and poor for it to be meaningful in God's sight. Selective obedience is extremely dangerous. It was one of the key failings of the Pharisees, and James goes on to warn about this. In verse 10 he writes, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. And he elaborates further on this in verse 11. God's law requires complete obedience. Any failure is sin, and any sin disqualifies us from being acceptable to God. Not one of us can stand. Thank you, Lord, for the cross. The second issue James deals with is that favoritism will be judged by God. Verse 12 reads, So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty, which can be better paraphrased in English as keep on speaking and keep on acting in the reality of the coming judgment. Judgment day is real and it is coming. The authors of the Bible were keenly aware of that and so must we be in order to live our lives well. The cure for partiality and favoritism, both of which are a form of passing judgment, is to remember that we will also be judged. On the great day of judgment, all our sins will be revealed and we will truly understand the enormity of them. At that time, we will also truly appreciate the enormity of God's grace in redeeming us. But also in verse 12, James describes God's law as the law of liberty. Satan's great lie since the beginning of history is that God's laws are oppressive, designed to take the pleasure out of life, that God wants us to be joyless and miserable. It's a tremendously successful lie. How many people, even Christians, live their lives as if, as if this were true, at least to some extent? Yet Jesus said in John 10 verse 10, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. At the judgment, this lie of Satan and the truth of the Bible will finally be revealed to all. Sin is enslaving and is bondage. God's law is liberation. The third point that James makes is that favoritism indicates an unmerciful spirit. We see this in verse 13. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This does not mean James is suggesting we can overcome, overcome judgment, that is, gain salvation, by us showing mercy to the poor and needy or to anyone else. We are saved only by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. There is no other way. What it does mean, as one commentator very well puts it, failing to show compassion on our fellow men proves 
ourselves to be utterly devoid of Christian character. Christian people are the children of God. They bear his image. They copy his example. It is therefore impossible for them to fail to share in his compassion, to fail to reflect his spirit of mercy. Those who have been truly saved will, indeed must, give evidence of the merciful character of our God who saved us. And in doing so, they, or we, assure themselves that they are truly saved, that indeed mercy triumphs over judgment. Let us pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, Help us today to examine our own hearts and our lives in the light of today's scripture. Help us to be honest with ourselves, that we might truly identify and deal with any shred of favoritism and partiality in our own lives. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.